Hello, everyone. We will get started shortly. Thank you for joining us. We'll just wait for a few more to come into our Zoom room. Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today as we host a webinar um, called Understanding Moral Injury from a Character Domain Perspective. Uh, we are very honored to have Dr. Carl Castro join us and uh, present this presentation. Before we get started, I wanted to go over a couple of uh, housekeeping items. Uh, this is hosted by the USC Suzanne Dvorak Tech School of Social Work and the Advancement Alumni Relations Office. My name is Jennifer Chung Vanzini, Director of Advancement, and I am again very honored to be here to be a part of this conversation with Dr. Carl Castro. Uh, please use the chat box to share comments and to also type in your questions as we will have a Q&A uh, portion at the end of today's presentation. Thank you so much again for uh, joining us today. We are so grateful for uh, the time and attention as we talk about a very important um, topic. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Dr. Carl. Um, he is uh, the uh, currently professor and director of the military and veteran programs here at the Suzanne Dvorak Tech School of Social Work at the University of Southern California. Dr. Castro is one of the leading military behavioral theorists in the world. Before joining the U uh, USC, Professor Castro served in the US Army for over 30 years. He began his military career as an infantry uh, man in 1981 and completed two tours in Iraq, as well as serving on peacekeeping missions to Saudi Arabia, Bosnia, and Kosovo, retiring at the rank of Colonel. Dr. Castro has chaired numerous NATO and international research teams, and he is currently chair of the NATO research program a research group on military veteran transitions and co-chair of a team exploring the development of military and veteran radicalization. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Carl. I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, you and hand it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I want to thank everyone for for joining us this afternoon or morning depending on where or uh where you're at in the world uh just an apology uh hazel tool couldn't make it today and so i apologize that everyone one she can't make it she sends her apologies and i apologize to all of you because now you're going to have to listen to me give this entire presentation versus hearing uh, hazel give probably a much more lucid and interesting talk but anyway um, those apologies. Let's jump right into this. Oh, I want to begin by saying the bulk of the presentation um, that we're going to uh, have today really is focused on a publication um, that came out earlier this year, and here is the DOI link to it. It's going to be posted in the chat for those of you who want to get the article and read it in more detail, but this presentation is going is primarily based on, on, that, on that paper. And next slide. So let's just jump right in to moral injury and and where did it begin? And you know, moral injury, um, if you believe Jonathan Shea has been around for over two thousand years, and he though brought it to uh, a contemporary review with the work that he did with Vietnam veterans who returned home. Next slide sort of provides um, a, a um, more contemporary update on moral injury. 
that no one truly recovers from war. No one is ever made whole again. This is from school repair, book school repair. But we must recognize that the face that they've injured are moral being in court. So here you start seeing the word moral used quite a bit, quite a bit in, in, in contemporary writing, and especially for those uh, clinicians and providers and supporters of veterans who return home from combat. Next slide. There are three um, sort of popular definitions, if you will, of moral injury. There's actually more than three. So I apologize if of someone who's on, on the, the webinar, I don't highlight yours. But again, Jonathan Shea first brought uh, the definition to light and, and, and that was followed about seven years later by Brett Litz and then Brock and Latini um, about eight or nine years ago. And there have been subsequent definitions since then uh, on the definition of moral injury. I'm not gonna go through all of these various definitions because I think that you all can read them for yourself. But I think one of the most important things to take away from this is that moral injury is primarily defined from a biopsychosocial spiritual perspective. Okay. And, and that's sort of the, the commonality. Shay's definition really focuses more on being a victim of what a larger organization or a nation or leaders has done to service members. Uh, Litz is one more of both a things that you've experienced uh, that challenge your moral uh, uh, compass, if you will. And then Brock and Latini kind of combines those two into a, a broader definition of things that were done to you or things that you may have done to someone else by, the, your, by action or by failing to act. Next slide. So when you look at um, the definitions of moral injury, one of the things that really um, sticks out is the ethics and, and, and moral moralis has at its origin, at its foundation, this reference to character. Uh, in the Greek ethos, or ethicus means pertaining to individual character or disposition. In Latin, moralis means pertaining to character or temperament, proper behavior of a person within society. Okay, next slide. So what are these um, sort of character building blocks, if you will? In the military, we talk about values. Every service, whether you're in the Marines or the Air Force, the Navy, the Army, the Coast Guard, um, I imagine the Space Command as well, or the Space Force, there's this set of values that each of these services try to adhere to and try to develop. But character isn't just influenced by being in the military. And this diagram here makes an important point. We get our character, who we are, what, who, what defines what we believe in, our religious history, our religious experiences, from society, from family, from education, and the military. So all of these entities work together to shape who our character is. And for those who've served in the military, your character development, your character, um, who you are, is greatly influenced by that experience. Next slide. Now, one of the most important things that we try to get across is that your identity, who you are, your character, is the same no matter what role you're currently performing. And we all have multiple identities. You have an identity, your personal identity, who you think you are, how you want others to see you. You have a social identity. And in this example, an identity affiliated with the military. So your military identity. And then you have your role, again, in this schematic, as a, as a father or as an uncle or as a grandfather, and wherever, whatever your identity is, it exists in all of these contexts. In this example here, it's, it's the, the 
the characteristic courage or courageousness. And for those of you who are familiar with Lord Moran's Anatomy of Courage, he makes this point um, very, very strongly that a man of courage in peacetime is a man of courage in war, and a man who lacks courage and lacks dignity in peacetime will lack dignity and lack courage in wartime. And, and this was a new concept, even though uh, I think it makes sense in that many people thought, well, you know, I can act immorally here, but when the chips are down, you'll really see the kind of person I am. And I think most of us in the military have heard the, uh, the saying that, that stress and pressure doesn't build character, it reveals it. And that's what Lord Moran was getting at. Next slide. So one of the things that we sort of ask fundamentally is what happens to character and identity when we fail to uphold things that we value or that we fail to uphold those virtues that we think are important. Next slide. And what we have argued is that moral failure really exists on a continuum. And this continuum begins with a moral slip, such as cheating scandal at West Point that can become a moral stain. The example we give here is Martin Bashir's deception of Princess Diana when he did the BBC interview that maybe represents a, a possible character flaw. And when we talk about moral injury, we, it usually is centered around war or war trauma. And here we think, you know, this is when we're talking about war, moral injury, where our character has broken down. We have done things that we're ashamed of, but it's difficult to live with. And, and then if you act in an immoral, continuous basis, we call that moral decay or an altered character that really distorts your identity. And we think that's really a deep character flaw. So one of the things that we try to highlight is that some of these moral failures are not clinical. They're not clinical manifestations that requires a clinical intervention. Uh, and the type of moral failure could result in two to three months of clinical care, or maybe a, loft, a lifetime of psychoanalysis to really analyze the person you are and the person you've become. Next slide. So you can think about it as the picture of Dorian Gray, where you're a young man in, in, in full focus. And as you engage in moral failures, who you are, not only to yourself, but to others starts becoming blurry and out of focus until the point where you're almost not recognizable as, as a person, although you can see it in the frame, you can see a person there, but you can see the smudging, the smudging of the character that, that I was referring to earlier. Next slide. So it's the real self is moral and good, and then it's the undesired self. And, and again, you know, these undesirable traits is, can become who we are if we engage in them all the time. Next slide. So we have defined, this is a, if you will, a layman's definition of PTSD, which we think lies in the illness domain. And often in, you know, to the credit of those who who treat uh, veterans and, and any individual with post-traumatic stress disorder, and to include Jonathan Shea, it's when he started seeing things that didn't quite fit the definition, that didn't quite fit the diagnostic criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. And so here we've defined PTSD as a mental health problem that some people develop after experiencing or witnessing a life-threatening event like combat, natural disaster, car accident, or sexual assault. And there are many other types of traumas, but this was sort of our shortened definition. And the important point here is not everyone develops post-traumatic stress disorder following or witnessing a life-threatening event. 
Moral injury, however, we contrast was as a failure to adhere to a virtue or a value that results in needless suffering or death that threatens one character or identity. So you can see in the moral, the, the main distinction here is that it influences one's character and identity through values and virtues that one holds dear. And none of that is really part of the definition of post-traumatic stress disorder. Next slide. So this is the crazy busy slide that, that we developed that we think is important because it basically, it, this is a, a two process theory or model of moral injury, a dual pathway model. And basically what we argue here, and I know there's lines going everywhere, but let me just try to really simplify it. An event, the same event can activate two independent pathways, but they interact, okay? So they're independent pathways, but they can also interact. And the event can activate your the, what we call the character domain or the illness domain. And the illness domain we're all very common, very familiar with. It's, it's what leads to post-traumatic stress disorder or depression or a wide variety of mental health um, disorders that require clinical care. The other domain that's impacted is the character domain, which we believe is where moral injury um, lies. And here the character is influenced. And then the character interacts with our identity. Remember I mentioned earlier, our personal identity, our social identity, our role identity, all these various identities that we possess interacts with character. And the outcome of these could be possible changes in who we are. So in both, both strengths or impairments. And these outcomes can interact with each other. So the character domain can interact with the illness domain and vice versa. And this circle at the end here, sustaining forces, these are things that can protect us or that do protect us against the negative changes that can occur following an event. And there are also things can exacerbate the negative outcomes that can follow from an event. So one can imagine if you're in combat and, and you, you accidentally kill a civilian and there's an investigation and you're prohibited from going on patrols and you're being put under a microscope, that will exacerbate your feelings that you had done something wrong versus a, a response that would be more measured that would say, you know, chaos and combat happens, accidents happen, no one's perfect, we support you, let's get on with the mission. So those are two very different responses to the same outcome. One can serve as a protective factor against both post-traumatic stress disorder and we would argue moral injury, and one can exacerbate possibly both of them. Next slide. So we think it's important then when you talk about moral injurious events to be very clear on what kind of events we're talking about. Historically in the literature, when you look at it, the focus tends to be on traumatic events that happen in combat amongst military service members. Not exclusively, but that's the main focus. What we argue is that events may be traumatic and they also may be non-traumatic events that can lead to injurious, injurious events, such as lying. That's not a traumatic event but it can lead, if you lie all the time, on every occasion, that can cause moral damage to your identity and affect who you are. Events may be single or multiple, we know this, and it may be specific to the military or civilian specific or both. So there's nothing inherent in being in the military that leads to moral injury itself other than a lot of decisions, a lot of high stake decisions often are made all the time, particularly in combat. But these kinds of decisions are also made among civilians as well. Next slide. 
Now, how can, what are the various ways that a moral injury may arise? Well, when a person becomes aware of aspects of themselves that they didn't think they could do, right? Many of us would have a hard time saying, hey, could you kill a five-year-old child just for the fun of it? Most of us, hopefully all of us would say, I absolutely would never do that. But often what happens when you find yourself doing things that you didn't think you could possibly do, or you observe things without feeling the need to intervene, you just stand by and do nothing and don't even feel the need to respond. That could lead to a moral injury. Feeling pressure, as Jonathan Shea talked about in Achilles from Vietnam, from your organization to do things that you don't think are right, that you know to be wrong, that can lead to moral injury. And this is the work that Jonathan Shea made the rest of us very much aware of. Or you believe that the world has changed in some way or revealed itself in some way that you no longer feel you're a part of or you don't want to be a part of, that your identity no longer fits in. And you see a lot of these kind of identities for former members of radicalized groups who've left the group because they see that their own identity no longer fits in with the identity of the organization they once were a member of. Next slide. So we think that, the, you know, just to characterize the illness domain and the character domain a little bit, the illness domain comprises those physiological, emotional, and cognitive areas. The character domain primarily is, in, as I mentioned earlier, can lead to a variety of mental health uh, uh, and behavioral health issues. The character domain is primarily focused on character and identity. Uh, that are impacted by the event. And it's already mentioned, there's this continuum we think exists from moral slips to stains to injury to character flaws. And disruptions can range. And, and we kind of describe these borrowing from the literature from speckled, spoiled to disgrace. So someone who has displayed extreme lack of moral integrity or moral bearing uh, we will say they're disgraced or they're a broken person. So the domains are separate, as I mentioned earlier, yet they interact to result in behavior um, that results from experiencing the event. And sometimes there's a lot of confusion about, well, is this, is this post-traumatic stress disorder or a mental health issue, or is this moral injury? And the reason is because oftentimes the reactions, the behaviors can appear and are quite similar. Next slide. So again, talking a little more about the symptoms, there are two sets of symptoms and impairments that might arise. One set of symptoms from the illness uh, domain and another set of symptoms, as I mentioned, from the character domain. Now these symptoms can be similar and oftentimes they require or can require clinical intervention, but oftentimes Clinical interventions aren't what's necessary, sometimes mentoring and counseling. And this is where uh, chaplains and, and priests and preachers and rabbis can be, play a very, very important role because a lot of our virtues and a lot of our values around morality, we gain from religion. So if one is a religious person, sometimes the recovery can be facilitated best through the religious institutions. Next slide. So I talked a little bit about the sustaining forces and as these, these forces are what can moderate or mediate the impact. They can be multi-level. Multi they can occur at the individual, peer, leader, and organizational level. They can have a direct effect on behavior or symptoms as well as on the character. So the values and virtues that an organization espouses can be leveraged to help sustain uh, an individual. And it can be both interpersonal and intrapersonal. Interpersonal meaning how I think about myself, how I think I should, what actions I should engage in, but also helping others, you know, know what acts to engage in. Next slide. 
So can the, the question always becomes, can character be redeveloped or developed? And if so, who should develop it? I already mentioned that the military has, for the most part, accepted that character is important and character does develop. Character forms, whether it's shaped or not. And, and I know the Army and the Navy and even the Air Force Marines, they've taken a more active role in identifying those values and actively work to shape them. Next slide. So the question then becomes, how are they reshaped? And here's a, a uh, just a schematic of the Army for character development. I'm in no way advocating for this, for this model, even though I served in the Army for a number of years. But I just want to highlight that they see the Army organization across the board playing a very, very important role in shaping identity that interacts with culture, that interacts with the climate of the organization. So they've taken this very comprehensive interactive approach to character development. Next slide. So in the Army, it's a continuous process. And of course it is because one's character continues to develop, it continues to be molded and altered through the aging process. And we won't go into the, the theorizing around the development of morality, but there, there are very important theories out there that, that speak to that issue and speak to the issue of when characters developing, it's best to be done from a mentoring supportive framework. So again, it just highlights once again, the importance of mentoring leadership and the values that an organization not only espouses, but embeds in everything they do from education to training to deployment and how they conduct their, their missions and operations. Next slide. So, you know, we, there's, this is another model. So I, again, as I said, I don't, I'm not wedded to any particular model, but here's one where character counts. And the, and the target here is school administrators and teachers and trying to develop sort of they have this character wheel of character emphasizing the things that they think are important for teachers in an educational environment. Next slide. Here's another model just so there's no lack of character development models out there. Here's one. Um, uh, that, that targets military veterans in transition. You can see a wide variety of, of character strengths here. There's 24 of them. Um, but and here's the link if you want to learn more about those. Next one. Here's one on ethical fitness. So here is the audience's corporation, schools, and government organizations. And here you can see being honest and responsible, fair, respectful, and compassionate. These have you know, you can see some overlap between these values and, and values, uh, Army values, for example, or Navy values. Next slide. So what are the implications of, of if moral injury is different than PTSD or other mental health disorders? What is the, what are the implications? Well, one is that one can have a moral injury without having a mental illness and vice versa. They don't always have to um, uh, go hand in hand. One doesn't lead to another. The time course can differ, okay? An illness onset may be quicker than a character change or vice versa. And stronger character can ensure more ethical behavior, but paradoxically, it can also result and a moral injury because you're doing reflection on, on actions that you took and you may beat yourself up over it. So character, while it can help protect you, ensuring that you do the right thing, when you don't do the right thing or you don't perceive you've done the right thing, said more correctly, that can also then lead to a moral injury. Next slide. So interventions then need to be different. And many, many people have already talked about this, so I'm not going to belabor the point. But the key issue here to take away is that 
traditional psychotherapies that are targeted in the illness domain, like prolonged exposure therapy, cognitive processing therapy, will not be, will not effectively address disruptions in the character domain. We need something else. And folks are working on interventions as I speak to identify what would be the best approach to do that. Next slide. So in rebuilding character, we say it's about reclaiming one's identity on, on who they are. So oftentimes we engage in these corrective virtues, such as working for nonprofit organizations, giving back to the community, having an, an occupation where we can derive meaning and, and um, purpose. And by doing these things, so if you believe in the Stoics approach to uh, virtue, by doing things that are virtuous, you strengthen your character. And by strengthening your character, you're rebuilding your character and reclaiming your identity. So this is a very simple schematic cartoon, but I think you see the point. It's about really engaging in, in, in behaviors that help you reclaim who you believe you are, who you want to believe. Next slide. Obviously, lots of research is needed. Um, you know, this theory, so we know it's wrong, right? We know all theories are wrong, and, and we don't know what parts of it their, their theory are wrong. We think there are aspects that are correct, but we need to test those and confirm not we're right or wrong. We always have to be open to being being wrong. I'm not going to go through all of the needed research. You know, as a as a researcher myself, you're probably saying, well, of course you think there needs to be more research. But to be quite candid, we do need more research. Next slide. So here's um, a point of contact again. So we showed it in the beginning. This is how you can reach me. Uh, here's how you can reach Hazel. So she would love to hear from you. And here's just a quote. We, we of course, we love William James. And so William James, I often, the best way to find a man's character would be to seek out that particular mental or moral attitude in which when it comes upon him, he felt himself most deeply, intensively active and alive. At such, there's a voice inside which he speaks and says, this is the real me. So what is the real you? Uh, next slide. Or right, so I think we're opening it up for uh, questions and answers now, or uh, Q&A. So if anyone has questions, please type them in. I see some people have typed them in, but I think uh, Amanda's going to, to talk to this. I saw some flash up about, will the slides be made available? Absolutely, the slides will be made available. And, and, and I think the paper, you've got the link to the paper. So please, you know, look at it, critique it. Tell me where we're wrong, how we need to make this a, a better approach, because ultimately the goal of making this distinction is there are a lot of service members in particular, and that's my research area, but there are a lot of people who suffer from a moral injury, and our goal is to figure out the best way to help them recover from their moral injury. So anyway, I'll stop there and, and then open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Castro, for sharing this presentation. Uh, we did have some great uh, questions come in. So I'll go ahead and read a few of these. And again, as Dr. Castro mentioned, we will be sending you a recording of today's uh, webinar as well as the slides. And of course, uh, feel free to uh, reach out to Dr. Carl Castro as well as uh, Dr. Atul for any questions. So we have a question here, how does brain development play into moral injury, especially when most people enter service before full brain development? So this is a very, very uh, great question. Yeah, and, 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 and Kohlberg talks about the, you know, the moral development and, and, and you know, he has stages. It's a stage theory of moral development. And we don't know a lot about that other than you know, from studying children, when do children, can children tell right from wrong? Um, when do they see how their behavior impacts other people, right? Most of us are really good at seeing how others' behaviors impacts me, but some of us struggle to see how our behavior impacts other folks. 
and then showing sort of true empathy. And, you know, the Stoics always talked about, you know, reflection being a really important part of becoming a virtuous person, right? It, 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 reaching that, that state of blessedness or happiness or eudaimonia, as Dr. Hazel Toole talks about. But it's really, a, it's, in, it's fundamentally about reflecting. And some people struggle to self-reflect. Like, why do you think the way you, th you think? You know, like, I'm very anxious right now. Why am I anxious? Or I'm very angry. Why am I angry? There's nothing really to be angry about, but why am I angry? It's some of those things, you know, some of the symptoms of post-traumatic stress is sort of mirror that, right, with the hyperarousal and the hypervigilance. Because if you're in an environment where someone is trying to kill you day in and day out, you develop this very hyper vigilance mode, right? We call it hyperstar or hyperreactivity, but, you know, that's the clinical definitions for it. The, the practical definition in combat is hypervigilance, and hypervigilance is a very good thing in an environment where someone's trying to kill you, right? But then when you come back, you're still hypervigilant. You don't just shut it off, and all of a sudden, you'll, you'll see something in your environment that will remind you, perhaps, of something in another environment, and we know that receptors and connectivities are being made. So it's affecting the biology, right? It's affecting the biology. And we really don't know, for example, what happens when you're in this hyper aroused state and you experience a trauma, right? What happens when you lay a trauma on top of someone that is in this hyper aroused state? Is that what can lead to long-lasting or post-traumatic stress disorder, unless afterwards we do good debriefings and we calm down those, those receptors and that, and that reactivity that's happening. Now, this is kind of at the brain level, but we do know there's also a developmental time course to it as well. Oh, great. Uh, oh, a lot of great questions coming in here. Um, so we have one here. How does um, ACEs affect our service members after their service has ended? The, the ACE? Is the ACE, adverse, ACE's it, effect. It, it, so adverse childhood events, is that? Is that they have it abbreviated. So maybe. I'm assuming know. that's it. If, is that it? Yes. Thank you. Is that? Oh, right. That, it, yes. Um, well, one, we know that adverse childhood events is not a good thing, right? We all know that if, if children have suffered emotional and physical trauma, that it's going to impact them. And it's going to, you know, you look at all the literature, it makes them more susceptible to the reactions of trauma that they may experience in the military for sure. And when they leave the military, there, uh, there is literature showing that, that those folks who had adverse childhood experiences on top of the military experiences can make the transition back to the civilian community much more difficult. So yes, it, it's very, very important. Obviously, it's best to prevent these things from happening in the beginning than to respond instead of responding to them. Now, it's not 100%, of course, not everyone who's had an adverse childhood experience or background is permanently incapable of, of functioning. In fact, most children, even those who come from adverse childhood backgrounds, still go on to be a very productive uh, adult and contribute to society in important ways. So I just add that because I don't think we want to pigeonhole people and say, oh, you had an adverse childhood experience. We don't want you in our organization because I think that would be a mistake. A question here. Much of your talk today seems to be about the aspect of moral injury in which someone doesn't act in accordance with their values. Can you say more about instances in which someone experiences moral injury because they have been betrayed by an organization or situation where their character and values are violated by others? Oh, yeah. And, and I think the most, um, besides the 
you know, the experiences of many Vietnam veterans as is articulated very beautifully by Jonathan Shea. I won't repeat those, but you do see these themes coming up among service members who have been raped, both women and men who have been raped while they're in the military. Because these sexual assaults, these rapes, generally are per perpetrated by members of the military, often members of their own unit, it's people you've trusted, and they betrayed that trust. And, and oftentimes, I say, oh, well, that's PTSD. But I think when you really um, uh, look deeper into it, there's oftentimes a, a moral injury. And it's one of the one of the reasons that has been offered is why victim individuals have been raped take longer to recover because of that violation of trust. And in fact, you can see the betrayal is an intimate part of Jonathan Shea's definition. It, betrayal is a central component of his definition of moral injury. Thank you. Um, question from Angie, how should this research inform veteran re-entry services from employers' perspective um, what can companies, companies do to provide better care and retention? Uh, workplace chaplains, a, a good idea, something else that you have seen that might be more successful? Well, you know, so there's a lot in that question. So let me try to break it up a little bit. So the last part, I think chaplains and, and the clergy and preachers and rabbis and they have a very, very important role to play in this if the individual is from a religious tradition, okay? If they're not from a religious tradition, it's not going to be helpful, all right? So let me just say that. But if someone is from a religious tradition, these men of God, if you will, can play a very, very important role, and I think should play a very important role. From a larger perspective, we all sort of have this spiritual component, you know, this kind of feeling that there's something greater than ourselves that we can't really articulate. And here, just in having a good mentor and a good advisor would be very, very useful. Now, you mentioned what can employers do? Most veterans are fine. So I want to first start there. I don't want every, anyone on this webinar to think, oh my goodness, every veteran is broken and is suffering from PTSD or a moral injury and all of that, because that is not the case. That is not the case. And in fact, I would argue reflecting on your morality is a really good thing, not a bad thing, okay? You know, I know a lot of people think that the military trains individuals to become cold-blooded killers without any reflection. That's just not, it's just not true. And service members, soldiers and Marines in particular, who I know very, very well and studied for many, many years, always reflect on their actions. Did I do the right thing? Did I do more harm than good? These are moral reflections. These are moral reflections. And having good leaders at the junior level all the way up, good chaplains there to help guide them in their reflections can be very, very powerful. I, and I don't know if I really answered your employer question or not, but I kind of dodged it by saying it's not really an issue. Don't, don't focus on it. But I, I, veterans will have issues just like anyone else and they're not unique and I think and I hope that I can highlight that that moral uh, injuries is just not is just not a problem or a challenge for those who served in the military but it affects everybody and, and we saw that in spades during the pandemic where healthcare providers had to triage who got care and who didn't get care when they ran out of supplies those lead to moral injuries uh, we have so many questions here. Um, are there any current or upcoming research projects that we could possibly refer veterans to? Uh, especially, I know we have a lot of um, folks who are also social workers working with the vel uh, veteran and uh, community. Any resources that can be available now? There is a lot of resources on how to talk about uh, 
moral issues from a from a clinician perspective. You can get those online. Um, there are lots of ongoing studies looking at um, effective interventions for moral injury. I don't at this moment um, say go to this one, go to that one because the evidence is still being accumulated. And, and so I would just be given a bias, but it wouldn't be an evidence-based bias. It would just be, this seems to make the most sense to me, but you could do that yourself. And, and I would recommend you do that yourself versus me. If you want me to do that, we can get offline and, and have a longer conversation about pros and cons to, um, to various approaches. Obviously, we are very interested in, in evaluating some, some key components. Um, the one person who I will call out is Harold Koenig uh, at Duke. He is, in my opinion, one of the great thinkers in this topic. He, he's not the only one. There's lots of great thinkers in this topic, but he's the one I really like. And so Google Harold Koenig's work. It's just top notch. It's just top notch. And, and other work, too. Uh, Bill Nash has done some great work. Uh, Brett Litz is doing some great work. Um, so there are a lot of folks doing some really, really interesting work in this area. Um, are there any specific places or certification programs where we can get trained or specialized uh, in providing clinical services to people who suffer from moral injury? Not that I'm aware of, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. It just means Cashel doesn't know of them. But so if anybody else knows of them, please email me what those resources are. Uh, but I'm not aware of any uh, but there, that doesn't mean there aren't any. Okay. Um, and here's a question. What are your thoughts on complex moral injury for veterans with PTSD and or mistrust due to a history of racial issues? Could you, could you say that question sure. again? What are, your, what are your thoughts on complex moral injury for veterans with PTSD and or mistrust due to a history of racial issues? Oh, so... You know, th thank you for that question. So this is an example of um, where racial behavior can um, result in a moral injury to the person who's engaging in the racial behaviors, okay? And there are lots of examples from athletes who talk about how when African Americans were being integrated into the NBA, into the Major League Baseball, how they were not as supportive as they could have been. They just were just indifferent. So you would say they weren't racist, I guess would be the language, but they weren't anti racist, right? They just weren't racist. And as they reflect back, they realized I could have done more. I could have done a lot more to help my fellow teammates and I didn't and and there's an interesting component to that it, it's a reflection as one gets older moves into their 70s and 80s and oftentimes you'll see World War II veterans Korean War veterans who appear to be just playing PTSD symptoms as they're reflecting on their behaviors in combat. They were fine, healthy, held a job for 60 years, post 50 years post-military, and literally towards their end of their life, when they're reflecting on where they're going, I would argue, they start saying, did I do the right thing? And, and folks have, have called that late onset PTSD. I'm not convinced that that's what it is. I'm more convinced now that it's probably a moral injury that they're grappling with finally, that they did some things that maybe they're not so proud of and they're wondering if it was the right thing. And, and I just open that up because people have described it as PTSD, but some of the case studies that I have read, it reads more like a moral injury, more like a, I'm going to be meeting my maker soon. And have I made the right amend atonement for what I've done? That's what could be happening. Again, this is just me speculating, but it got me thinking about it in relationship to the race question 
because you see that in sports because, you know, sports are now fully integrated for the most part. There's still some issues with NASCAR and other organizations, but for the most part, it's fully integrated, certainly NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball. And it's these older athletes who were part of that integration process who are having these kinds of issues. And you also see it with former members of extremist groups like the KKK and the white supremacy groups. You see those who kind of broke away, talk about what kind of person does that as they reflect on their behaviors and, and their beliefs, because they believed, not only did they do these things, they believed what they were doing was the right thing to do. So absolutely uh, issues around race can, can lead to moral injuries from the perpetrator's perspective. Mm -hmm. Uh, taking this, uh, this question about um, how about for, uh, I just lost this right here, um, for uh, frontline healthcare workers and, and there's a question about, you know, moral injury for the police force, you know, what are your thoughts on uh, those who are on the front lines, you know, and their, especially during the pandemic and the effect of, of what's been going on? Well, you know, in both of these situations, there's quite the very similarities between military, right? In that during a pandemic, frontline people are risking their lives. Police could be risking their lives. And, and you know, going through the scenarios of what you may be confronted with is very, very powerful. I would say that training you know, preparing, okay, what are we going to do when X happens? What are we going to do when Y happens? But we also have to just be very cognizant that, that frontline folks need a lot of support. And sometimes they're, they, they're exhausted and they don't have the energy to take care of themselves. Or sometimes in the military and the, the police, for example, they want to be left alone. And I respect the right for people to be left alone, but also we want to make sure that folks aren't suffering needlessly. And, and oftentimes the person suffering is the last person to know from a moral injury, but others can see it in their behavior. And that's when we owe it on ourselves to make sure there's a, there's a rotation schedule that gives them a break. And I know during the pandemic that that just was not possible for many of the healthcare providers to give them time off because they needed every one of them plus another 50 or 100. And so it makes it very, very difficult, but leaders of organizations have got to really take a leading role in here and insist that folks get time off. And, and what would that time off look like and what would be the best use of that time? Obviously a big part of it is just sleep, right? Because getting good sleep is really, really important for one's health. And if you're going to engage in any kind of recovery, you've got to be well rested in order to process your experiences. You can't be exhausted and falling asleep while you're trying to do that. So you need to be well rested. So I'm a big, big proponent of sleep, good sleep, hygiene, getting plenty of rest. That's easier said than done, but, but I think that's where it has to start. Thank you, Carl. I have one last question and we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up, but we will try to, um, again, uh, provide, uh, Carl has graciously allowed, um, you know, shared his email and please uh, feel free to reach out to him. Uh, just one last question. What advice would you give to the spouse and family members, you know, um, those who would like to help um, folks who are just dealing with, with the aspects of moral injury? You know, one of the things I always say is you people who have experienced um, significant events, you have to give them space. Mm -hmm. You have to let them tell their story on their own timeline. Yeah. It, sometimes you want to force it. Come on, tell me your story. What's bothering you, right? That's mm -hmm. not going to be helpful. I understand the urge to do that. And, and sometimes spouses just get tired and they'll say, either you get help or I'm leaving you, mm -hmm. right? And then they trot off the therapy and then tell the therapist, I'm not sure why I'm here. My wife is making me come here or my partner's making me come here. And but you do want to give them space and time and, and just listen for cues. Eventually, folks will tell their story. We don't want them to wait until they're 80 years old 
on their deathbed wondering what their maker is going to do to them for something they've done because yeah. that's awful i think that's not the way i would ever want to see any person in their life worrying about something they did 50 years ago yeah. or even 10 years ago and but it's really being patient and letting the story emerge and at the same time we have to work with those who are impacted you've got to be prepared to tell your story you've got to have a short version of your story that you can share with people that you're comfortable with practice it rehearse it write it down but you can't just say nothing right because then that just creates a void so it's from both sides it's from both sides Thank you so much, Dr. Castro. Um, truly so much. We can, we can go for another couple of hours talking about this topic, but thank you for the research that you and Dr. Toole have done. And again, the link to the research article, we'll, we'll see if we can email that as well in the follow-up. Um, and again, the, uh, this is a recorded webinar. We will also share that link as well as the slides. Um, just a couple more clo uh, closing announcements. Um, again, thank you again uh, for your support uh, by attending today's webinar. Again, my name is Jennifer Chung Vanzini. If you would like to support uh, the USC Military and Veterans Programs, um, please contact either myself or my colleague, Kelsey Viano and our information is there. Um, Dr. Carl, as well as many of his colleagues are tirelessly working. I don't know if he gets enough sleep himself um, uh, for all the work that the MVP does in uh, supporting our military social work students, um, reaching out uh, to the community, as well as the research, the ongoing research that uh, the Military Veterans, uh, Veterans Programs does. Um, please go ahead and um, uh, again, contact us as well as Dr. Castro. Thank you so much for joining us today. We truly appreciate your time and attention and we hope that you will continue to fight on. Thank you everyone.